An account by Lieutenant Colonel Frank Bourne, OBE, DCM. This is a transcript of a radio broadcast published in the Listener, dated 30th of December 1936. In December 1872, when I was 18 years old, I enlisted in the 24th Regiment and received the princely pay of six shillings a day, of which three and a half shillings was deducted for messing and washing, leaving one shilling five and a half pence a week for luxuries. I went to bed every night hungry, but quite happy, and it made a man of me. The regiment had just come home from India after 15 years. Now, the A Company of any regiment in those days was always called the Grenadier Company, and was supposed to have the biggest men. I think the sergeant major must have been a wee bit humorous, for he posted me to our A Company, although I stood only 5 foot 6 inches and was painfully thin. After five years of home service in February 1878, the regiment received sudden orders to proceed to the Cape of Good Hope to take part in the Kaffir War. This was my first experience of active service, and shortly after my colonel promoted me to colour sergeant of B Company, 100 strong. I was only 23, very nervous, sensitive and afraid of my new responsibilities. Several men of the company were my own age, others older, some old enough to be my father, but after a few months I felt secure and thought I was getting on well. I also found myself unpaid private secretary to several men who could barely read or write, and I deciphered and answered their letters home, feeling quite happy in our relations. One day I heard a man named Wall ask my Batman if the kid was in. A day or two later I asked Partridge casually who the kid was, and received the answer, Why, you are, of course. My stock slumped at once. I think it does us all good to have our swollen heads reduced. But we were a very happy family. You can't live in tents and on Mother Earth for two years on active service without knowing your men intimately. The Kaffir War ended in June 1878, and we were moved to Peter Maritzburg, Natal, to assist in raising the curtain on the Zulu drama. On 11th of January we crossed the Buffalo River at Rourke's Drift into Zulu country. Our commander-in-chief was Lord Chelmsford. Our strength was 4,500 men, including 13 companies of my regiment, the 24th, now the South Wales Borderers. One company was left behind at Rourke's Drift to guard the hospital stores and the pontoons at the drift on the Buffalo River. This was my company, and at the time I was bitterly disappointed. We saw the main column under Lord Chelmsford engaged the enemy at once, and I watched the action along with my four sergeants from a little hill by Rourke's Drift. Then we saw them move on again, and they disappeared. And now I must tell you what happened to them during the next ten days. They made their camp under a hill called Isanawana, about ten miles away. Then days later, on the 21st, Lord Chelmsford learned that the enemy was in force ahead of the camp, and he moved out on the morning of the 22nd with nearly half his force to attack them. But as he advanced, they disappeared, and in his absence the camp was attacked and overwhelmed by 4,000 Zulus. So swift was the disaster that the few survivors who got away could give no reliable account of it, but the evidence of the dead, who were afterwards found and buried where they lay, told of the unvarying tales of a group of men fighting back to back until the last cartridge was fired. After the war, Zulu witnesses all told the same story. At first we could make no headway against the soldiers, but suddenly they ceased to fire. Then we came round them and killed them with their assegais. According to one account, the last survivor was a drummer boy who flung his short sword at a Zulu. This was the last occasion that band or drummer boys were taken on active service, as it was also the last occasion that the colours were carried into action. Lieutenants Melville and Coghill lost their lives that day trying to save the colours. Fully 1,200 men were killed and by half past one, no white man was alive in the Sandalwana camp. Of course, back at Rourke's Drift, we knew nothing of this disaster, although my sergeants and I on our hill, above it, could hear the guns and see the puffs of smoke. But an hour later, at two o'clock, a few refugees arrived and warned us of what to expect. One man whispered to me, Not a fighting chance for you, young fella. Up to that time we had done nothing to put our small post in defensive position, as our force in front was nearly 5,000 strong and had six guns, and the last thing we expected was that we should be the saviours of the remainder of that force. The strength of our small garrison at the drift was two combatant and six departmental officers, and about 133 non-commissioned officers and men, 36 of whom were sick, leaving about 100 fighting men. Remember that 1,200 men had just been massacred at Isanawana. 
Can you then be surprised that, flushed with their success, the Zulus were making for our small posts, confident that we should be easy victims for their savagery? Having had the warning, but only two hours in advance as it turned out, we set to work to loophole the two buildings and to connect the front of the hospital with a stone cattle kraal by sacks of Indian corn and oats, and to draw up the two boar transport wagons to join the front of the commissariat stores with the back of the hospital. These proved excellent barricades, but by no means impregnable. The native has always been credited with deep cunning, but luckily for us, if the Zulus possessed any, he did not use it, for as a sax connecting the hospital had been laid on a slope of the ground, he could have safely crept along, cut up the sax open with his assegais, the corn would have rolled out, and he could have walked in, and I should now not be telling this story. When Lieutenant Chard of the Royal Engineers joined us, he approved of what we'd done, but considered the inner space was too big, and suggested a line of biscuit boxes. This was done, and proved of great value when the enemy set the